Hola, bienvenido a otra clase de Periodismo 100. Hoy estudiaremos la época colonial española. Today we're going to talk about the press during the Spanish period. Now this is a bit challenging because um, no one has written a truly accurate account of the Spanish period, especially the early years. Um, if in high school you were reading Zaide, then um, you, would, you would know history from a very American point of view. If you're reading Constantino, then of course you would have a very um, Marxist point of view. Um, in both cases, both are very biased um, and have left out a lot of um, material that could, should have been looked at in a more scientific and accurate reporting of events. In any case, we will focus on um, the press during this period or the latter years. Just as a little background, um, the Spanish occupation began in March 16, 1521 with the landing of Ferdinand Magellan and um, his three uh, Spanish armadas. Um, in fact, if you had read the Padlet, uh, we know that he was on the ship called Concepcion, and that's why the Immaculate Conception is the patron saint of the Philippine Islands. Uh, we do not know exactly, or actually there are three contentions where he actually landed. Uh, is it in Homonhon in Samar, in Limasawa in Leyte, or in Butuan? Um, there are historians who uh, defend each, uh, each place. So um, although um, Leyte um, has the legal or the historically legal um, standing when it comes to actual landing site um, in Humonhon, but um, up to now it is a contentious issue. The first permanent settlement was by Legazpi because of course Magellan was killed by Lapu-Lapu and basically they fled. Um, but later on in 1565 with Legazpi's arrival and his welcome by the locals, um, they were able to settle and later on identified or named the Philippine Islands after their um, Philip, their king. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind that each island of each 7,000 islands of the Philippines at the time were not united. There was a lot of infighting. Even the Datus um, were fighting among themselves. And basically, the identification as a nation began. Um, upon the um, naming of these islands as one country in 1565. But even then, um, I guess that's why we're up to now we're a bit, a bit regionalistic because there's a lot of bodies of water that separate um, each major island of this country. But let's look at the newspaper, since that is our uh, course. Um, there were three types of publications at the time. The commercial publications, which can be both Spanish or Filipino, um, owned and run. Uh, the propaganda papers, these were set up by the reformists or the ilustrados. Uh, many times it was um, set up like in Spain while they were studying. Um, and then the revolutionary papers, which were set up by the Katiponeros, um, which were clearly um, citing, inciting rebellion and speaking against 
uh, the Spanish colonial government. Um, journalism at this time is marked by censorship by the state, um, especially the ones, well, basically the ones that felt it were, the, of course, the revolutionary press, which could not publish openly. Um, all papers, both the Spanish and Filipino papers, were characterized by financial instability because funding was not continuous. Um, especially the ones of the reformist and revolutionary press, which was dependent on donations, um, which were not regular in coming. Um, most of the papers were published in Spanish with a limited circulation, uh, primarily reaching only the Spanish in the Philippines or the Spanish-speaking Filipino elite. Um, and then, of course, as we as we discussed in the last lecture, um, not the news was not as we know it. Um, it was a lot of opinion and biased um, accounts of the events. Um, there was no attempt to be objective um, and each paper took on the viewpoint of its publisher. The earliest known Filipino media is, of course, by the father of Filipino printing, Tomas Pinpin. Um, it would be good if, you know, after this pandemic period, if you visit the Chinoy Museum in Tramuros and learn more about um, this Filipino Chinese who um, started the printing press in the country and also the first newspaper. So he learned his printing from his professor in UST, Father Francisco Blancas de San Jose. Uh, Father Blancas de San Jose is also well known for his Artes de Reglas de Le Las Lenguas Tagala, um, which Pinpin printed. So basically he was teaching the Spanish to speak Filipino. And Pinpin, for his part, wrote the uh, reverse book the Librong Pag-aralan ng Mga Tagalog ng Wikang Castila or teaching Filipinos how to speak Spanish. So as we said, the first newspaper that um, we know is Filipino-owned was published by Tomas Pinpin in 1637, which is Successos Felices or Fortunate Events. So basically, it was a paper that had a lot of good news. Then you had Ojas Volantes, which is a one-page publication of the Spanish government, um, simply to put out the headlines um, or to report a crime that happened, like in the top part of the page, um, to warn people against um, criminals or um, to report about new government policies, etc. Then you had the Del Superior Gobierno, which first regularly issued newspaper by the Governor General Manuel Fernandez del Folgueras. Um, the thing about this is it did not really contain anything about the Philippines. It was a paper directed to the Spanish who were in the Philippines and reported things that was happening in Spain so that the local Spanish community would be aware of what was going on in their motherland. Also, um, the events that were happening in Mexico since um, before the, 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 boat, the galleon trade um, came from Spain but passed through Mexico before arriving in the Philippines. La Filantropia, which was published in 1821, was a weekly newspaper dealing with current issues from Europe and the arrivals and departures of vessels in Manila. So basically, it was a like a shipping um, magazine um, printed in papel de arroz or rice paper um, and basically informed people of the ships that were arri arriving and the products that it contained. So basically, it was a trade publication. There were other famous publications that 
like the El Ramilete, which actually had an effort to report things from a more objective point of view. And that's why it's known as a Frank newspaper. Um, but it had a mixed collection of, of many things from people's opinion to what was happening, like events that occurred, um, government policies, products, shipping information, etc. And then you had um, El Belo Sexo, or it was the first women's magazine um, that, of course, talked about mostly products that would interest women and articles that would interest women. El Comercio, um, which lasted from 1869 until well into the American period in 1926, was the newspaper with the biggest circulation. Um, and then La Esperanza, uh, in 1848 is the first daily newspaper which started um, two years prior but then had trouble with the censors and they had to stop and go. Um, I mean, it stopped and continued again. Um, El Pasig in 1862 was the first bilingual fortnightly both in um, had articles both in Spanish and Tagalog. Um, and so we can say that El Pasig was the advent of the local press because it was, it was the first one that carried the native language. Diario de Manila is a special mention because it was, first of all, um, the leading Spanish language Filipino published newspaper. It was well edited it actually tried to have real journalism in it. Although, of course, it did not have any controversial um, material. Um, it was edited by Felipe Del Pan and published by the Ramirez y Compañía. Um, it was the da a daily newspaper and broadsheet. Now, what is important about this? Um, of course, there were revolutionaries who were part of the paper, such as Isabella de los Reyes, um, who is the founder of the Aglipayan Church, and I think someone will report on him more, um, more thoroughly, and Apol Apolonio de la Cruz, one of the 13 martyrs of Bagumbayan, and he was the foreman at Diario de Manila, and he hired fellow Katiponeros to work in the printing press. Now, actually, um, why Diario de Manila was special mentioned because they were Diario de Manila during the day, but at night they would sneak or they would try to print copies of the Kalayaan, which is the subvers subversive paper by, um, by Bonifacio. Um, now, if they could not print, they were printing in the house in, in somewhere else, but they were getting the typeset of the Diario de Manila and sneaking it out um, for use in the printing of this revolutionary paper until they were caught. Um, and that's why the Diario de Manila was closed down um, because it was linked to the, Kala the Kalayaan. Um, in Spain, the propaganda movement started in 1888, led by Jose Rizal, Marcelo H. Del Pilar, Mariano Ponce, and Graciano Lotes Jaina. So, um, of course, they this took place before uh, before the revolution. Um, the Ilustrados were fighting for, the, that's why we call them reformists, because they were fighting for the rights of the Filipinos, but they were pushing that the Philippines be a province of Spain um, with the rights of the Filipinos the same as the Spanish. So they were not advocating independence. So, but it was the first of a kind to advocate the rights and reforms for the Filipino colony. Um, and was an inspiration in a way for the armed revolution itself. 
So, um, La Solidaridad was established in December 13, 1888. It was sponsored by a society of the same name. In fact, that came first, the Society of Reformers. Um, and the paper lasted until 1895. Um, so, it was, it was actually um, the editor-in-chief, and that's why our college is named after him is Marcelo H. Del Pilar, or who went by the pseudonym Plari Del. Um, the writers included Dr. Jose Rizal, who had two pen names, Laung Laan or Dimasalang. Then you had Graciano Lopez Jaina, whose pseudonym was Diego Laura. Antonio Luna, whose pseudonym was Tagailog. Mariano Ponce, who had three uh, pseudonyms, uh, Jose Maria Panganiban, Dominador Gomez. So, um, apart from this, these Filipinos, there were two um, foreigners who were writing for this paper and was part of the Filipino, uh, the, the reform movement. This was Professor Ferdinand Blumentritt, who was an Austrian ethnologist and a professor of Jose Rizal and Dr. Miguel Moraita Sagrario, a Spanish historian and professor and statesman. So what was Los Solidaridad fighting for? So as we said, that the Philippines be a province of Spain. Uh, for the Filipinos, uh, Filipino priests to have representation in instead of Spanish friars in parishes and remote sitios. Um, freedom of assembly and speech, and equal rights before the law. They were also trying to get a, a seat for the Filipinos in the Spanish Cortes. Um, and it's like having a congressman in the uh, legislature of Spain. So basically that's what they were fighting for. Then as we said earlier, the Kalayaan, which was a uh, 1890 published in 1898. Unfortunately, it had only one issue and um, it was, and because of the time of the persecution, most of the copies were burned. I don't know actually where to find an existing copy um, at the moment. Maybe one of, my guess is the Lopez Museum is the one that has one um, or the USD library. So this is the official organ of Bonifacio's Katipunan um, and edited by Emilio Jacinto, who basically wrote most of the articles. Um, prior to Kalayan coming out in March 1896, according to the diary of Pio Valenzuela, who's by, who, by the way, it was in his house, they were printing the paper after stealing the, um, the type um, the printing fonts from Diario de Manila um, or stealing or borrowing. Um, and basically, they were able to print 300 copies of the first issue. Um, and according to the diary of this, of Pia Valenzuela, um, after the publication of the first issue, Katipunan membership, which numbered only 3,000, um, became or grew to 20,000 members um, after this was published. And that's why, um, in a way, it alarmed the Spanish government because they their intelligence figured out that there was something going on and um, they were able to catch the or to prevent the publication of the second issue of Kalayaan, uh, which um, they had to burn the blueprint so as not to get caught. So um, basically, they raided the they raided uh, Diario de Manila, um, and and also they raided the house of Valenzuela. Um, who, of course, by then had burned all the evidence of the of the newspaper. That's why it only had one issue. And then there was also La, 
Republica Filipina, which was put up by Pedro Paterno. And this was the paper favored by the Aguinaldo regime. Um, this, you might say that this was also a revolutionary under the banner of a revolutionary press. Um, but it, it was not also objective. Basically, it also reported favorably um, uh, the point of view of Aguinaldo. Um, and its publication ran from September 15, 1898 to 1899. So um, it was also very one-sided in its approach to um, news. La Independencia, on the other hand, um, tried to be more objective. This is a paper that lasted from 1898 to 1900. It was also one of the official papers initially of the Philippine Revolutionary Government and it was established and edited by General Antonio Luna. Um, he, co he edited it until the outbreak of the Philippine-American War. Then um, after that, Raf um, Rafael Palma took over as editor-in-chief. Um, the idea of Luna is to have a paper that was independent in its viewpoint. So it was not catering, it was not um, echoing the viewpoint of Aguinaldo. In fact, if there was something um, they felt was not running well in the Philippine Republic, which was established on June 12, um, 1898, um, then they would actually write about it. And so Aguinaldo actually wanted to shut down this paper. Um, because it was not always favorable to him. Um, in any case, um, it was also this paper that first published the Spanish lyrics of the Philippine National Anthem entitled Filipinas and written by Jose Palma. So just in case you did not realize, um, the Philippines, our Bayang Magiliw or Lupang Hinirang, however you want to call our national anthem, was not in Filipino um, in the first several years um, of, or actually it was not, it was in Spanish during the first Philippine Republic and even um, during, the earth, during the American period. El Geraldo de la Revolución, or uh, the Filipino Herald, in other words, um, was the first official paper or like government newsletter, you might say, of the Aguinaldo government. Uh, in fact, um, today it still exists as the official gazette. So if you go to the Malacanang website, you will find the official gazette. Basically, all it does is print policies. Um, if there is a presidential decree, you will find it in full in this official gazette. So policies by the executive department. So that's the only thing it really prints up to now. Um, sometimes it, it, has re it might have news items, but only because these news items are related to a policy proclamation. So the Geraldo de Re Revolution, as with that title, ceased publication in 1899. But um, when when the government when the Philippine uh, government resumed after independence, it it uh, revived as the official gazette. La Libertad is another paper um, published by. Um, the Augustinian, well, was also a paper which was also for independence, published by Clemente Zulueta, who was actually one of the writers or staff writers of La Independencia. Um, and 
this was printed in a in an abandoned orphan asylum in Malabon, which was previously owned by the Augustinian friars. Um, but then this is also like the La Epidentia, one of the papers that Aguinaldo did not like. In fact, um, he thought it was too risky to allow the press to publish freely um, anything that criticized the fragile Philippine government. And so um, he required all publications to be authorized by himself. So basically, that's the important papers during the Spanish period. Um, we will learn more about the personalities who were there. Um, so that, you know, when you pass by the many streets of, the, of Metro Manila, going around, well, not only Metro Manila, but even in the other parts of the country, you won't wonder why is this name that way? You know, that the, the name should have more meaning to us. You know, for example, when you pass EDSA, do you know who uh, Epifanio de los Santos is? Why, why is a road named after him? Blumentritt, which is a big area in Manila. Why? Who is Blumentritt? You know? So we know that um, he's not he, he, he's not we might think he's one of the colonizers, but no, he is one of the reformers, and he's Austria. So I hope that uh, we learn to appreciate that as well. <laughs>